Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Avinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to welcome Juan Vioro here for the release of his new book, Horizontal Vertigo, A City Called Mexico, in conversation with Paul Thoreau. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days, and I want to give a huge thanks to Juan and Paul for joining us this evening. So to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. Uh, we'll try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here at the bottom through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book if you haven't already, very important, uh, as well as a link to pre-order Paul's upcoming book, Under the Waves of Waimea, which is out next month. A caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming for you leading into the summer. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out, on April 8th, we're thrilled to be hosting Helen Oyeyemi for the release of her new novel, Pieces, in conversation with Sarah Gran. Uh, again, that program is on our website now and taking registrations. And of course, many apologies for the delay in this program from yesterday. Uh, we are just absolutely thrilled, though, to have Juan here tonight to celebrate this brilliant book with all of you. So now a little about tonight's guest, and we will get started. Born in Mexico City in 1956, Juan is one of Mexico's preeminent novelists, uh, author of a half dozen prize winning novels. He is also a journalist. And in 2004, he received the Geralda Prize for his novel El Testigo. He is a huge soccer fan. And Paul is the author of over 50 books. His novels include The Lower River and The Mosquito Coast, which will be released as an Apple TV series in late April. His renowned travel books include Deep South and On the Plain of Snakes. He divides his time between Cape Cod and Hawaii, where he, which is the setting for his latest novel, which we mentioned earlier, uh, which will be published on April 13th next month. So Juan and Paul, the stage is yours. Okay. Um, ante todo, este un, una... Obra maestra, me encantó. Felicidades, Juan. Es tu mejor trabajo, mejor que paz, mejor que fuentes. Estoy orgulloso de ser tu amigo. And to the people watching, let me tell you, this is a fantastic book. This is the best book I've ever read about a city. And there are many books. There's uh, Orhan Pamuk's book about Istanbul. There's um, V.S. Pritchett's essay on London with, with photographs. Pritchett also wrote books about uh, Dublin and New York, but Pritchett's London is really good. E.B. White wrote a book called Here is New York, long essay. Joyce wrote about Dublin as a novel. Andre Bailey, uh, you may not be familiar with Andre Bailey. He wrote a book called Petersburg, which is very Joycean. But this, this is something else. This is a book which is autobiography, it's history, it's multi-layered. And as Juan says in the, in the title, it's horizontal. The city is horizontal, but it's not just horizontal. He uses this word palimpsest, the layers, palimpsest of memories. That beneath New York is what? Um, an island, um, nothing was built. Um, Native American huts perhaps, but nothing there. And Mexico City has layer upon layer upon layer of history. And so this is a book about the layers of Mexico City, including the layer, the historical or autobiographical layer of Juan Villoro. And there was a lake there and the lake has been obliterated. There was a volcano there. So it's, it's multi-layered. And the, other, the impressive thing is not just the Mexico City has Carlos Slim, who's a multi-billionaire, but and Juan writes about him. But he, he's also writing about street children. There's a whole section on street children. Um, Juan, I want to start by saying first, congratulations. As I said, this is your. I think I've read all your books, and I think this is your best. And this is the best book about Mexico. And you have this heavy competition with Octavio Paz and Fuentes. One in fiction, one in one in essay. The book is about more than Mexico City. It's also about the Mexican character, if there is such a person, the, the various types. Um, I want to ask you first how you came to write it, because it's this is not a random book. This is a very 
um, intricately structured book. You do say at one point, it was hard for me to finish this book at the end. So I, I can imagine that it would because you'd keep thinking of more, more characters, more places and, and more factors. But tell me how you um, got the idea and went about it. Where, where, did, where did it come from? Well, thank you so much, uh, Paul, for what you're saying. It's a real treat to be here with you, being you a master of, of the trade. Thank you so much for, for your words. And uh, well, you know, um, I didn't know that I was writing a book on the city. Many years ago, some 20 odd years, I wrote a piece on the Mexican subway. That was my first piece uh, on Mexico City. That was at the time of the Zapatista upheaval. 1994. And the Zapatista upheaval was very important for Mexico because for the first time uh, we thought that uh, the Indian heritage belonged to modernity. Uh, we were used, uh, people from my generation, to think about uh, the Indians, uh, the original people from Mexico, uh, as uh, some uh, people that uh, belong to the past. So they were the people who built uh, great pyramids and uh, our museums were full of uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, treasures of uh, the different Indian communities. But uh, we never thought of this uh, culture as being part of modernity. And they were alive and they had a uh, as, as different social and cultural projects and so on. So the Zapatista of Hebel said, for the last time, let us belong to the same country. Uh, we want a country of plurality. We want to be part of this. And so I, I started to think about uh, the different uh, uh, cultural signs that were surrounding me in Mexico City and that had some resembles to the Indian past, for example, the subway, because all Indian community uh, cosmologies, they start and end underground. So uh, the, it was only natural to associate uh, our subway with this uh, place where uh, Indian mythologies took place. Then there were uh, a lot of signals um, in the subway system. For example, there's a station called Pino Suarez in which you can find a pyramid. Or there is another station, the station Insurgentes, where there is a mural made out of uh, hand carvings that resemble uh, the uh, hand carvings of the Aztecs. And the signals in, in the subway system are uh, pictographic uh, signals. So uh, stations, they don't have a name, they uh, have a picture. Uh, and this resembles a codex uh, of uh, um, the kind of the codex that used to um, depict uh, the Maya or the Aztecs. So uh, suddenly I realized that my own surroundings uh, had something to do with this ancient past that became uh, at last something that was regarded as uh, belonging to the present. So that was my first uh, uh, chronicle about the subway. And I never thought I was going to write a book that was, as I said, some 20 odd years ago. But then I started to write in different styles about my city because I have lived here all my life and I hate and love the city at the same time. So I started to write personal memories and to do some interviews with people in the city and so on. And, and you know, uh, when, when you uh, live in a city, there are places that you know really well, places in, in which you have a lot of memories, but there are other places that uh, resemble uh, strange places for you, especially in a gigantic place like Mexico City. So I started to combine two different approaches to the city, a, a real personal one and another that was more a kind of survey about uh, different aspects of the city. And some 10 years ago, I said, well, I have enough material to write a book, but it was extremely chaotic. It resembled the city itself, because the city has a growth in, in this in a strange uh, um, uh, fashion. Uh, so I, I once said uh, 
uh, well, it was a kind of a joke. This, this material, it doesn't need an editor. It needs a urban planner because it resembles uh, the city uh, itself. So uh, then I started to uh, reshape uh, all the material as a book. And to be um, a true to my approach to the city, I wanted to have uh, a kind of book in which you can uh, approach in different ways uh, to the city. So uh, 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 a, a, a book a structure like uh, uh, the sapping of different images in which something was going to be really personal and other stuff was going to be a little bit remote. It was going to be something strange even for myself because uh, Mexico City um, resembles too many cities and it's not the same to live in a shanty town uh, in the outskirts of Mexico City or to live in a gated uh, community, a posh gated community in Mexico City. So I wanted to write about all this contrast and so on, but of course I knew that it was impossible to have, uh, let's say, a book that would uh, comprehend all the different cities that we call Mexico. Um, I had to settle with my personal approach. But that's, that's the best way. And that's why you, you write about it from a personal standpoint. You're in, uh, are you, you, where, did you, where did you grow up? You mentioned where you grew up. Was it Coyoacan? Well, I was born in uh, Miscuac. Uh, and that means uh, the place of the snakes. Uh, it was in the south part of Mexico City. And I have always lived in the south part of the city uh, in some 12 or 13 different addresses. But I have never crossed, uh, let's say, to the upper part of the city, to the northern part. Uh, so I, I know for sure uh, as a personal witness or as somebody who has experienced a lot of things, the south part of the city. But uh, I wanted to speak of the city as a whole in the way somebody like myself can do. But you know, when, when, when you write about the city, um, uh, you can write at the same time as another writer is uh, depicting the city and both uh, uh, stories are going to be uh, quite uh, diverse. I wanna ask you about, so when you put it together, now you have, the, the book is divided in a, in a very interesting way, um, structurally. So when you're reading the book, you're actually traveling through the city, seeing different places and different people. When you, were, when you started the book, did you have, for, for example, the characters, you, there's the sewer cleaner, the zombie, the quack, the tire repair man, the king of Coyoacan, the manager, I like the manager. He complicates life without being responsible for anything. <laughs> you also, he says, I pretend, they pretend to pay me and I pretend to work. <laughs> and then there's El Chilango. Well, El Chilango is sort of the, the classic Mexican. Did you have these written before you wrote, before you put the book together? Did you have a dossier of all these characters or, or say the places, or did you work through it chronologically and say, well, I'll put a place here, a person here. I'm just wondering when you sat down, what was in front of you? Yeah, well, it was a kind of an accident. I started writing in different ways about a city, but then I, I, I wondered how can I organize all this material? And I said, since my first um, text, my first approach to the city was a story about the subway, I can organize this material as subway lines. So when you go for the first time to London, New York, Paris, and so on, uh, you can... Um, uh, take one line in the subway and you can stop in different stations and you are going to know a kind of Paris or a kind of New York if you take for some days the same line. So I, I thought, well, I can have like six different lines. This can be like a subway system and I can trace um, uh, different, uh, let's say issues for each line. So one line, was going to be the line of the characters of the city. 
other line was going to be the special places of the city. Another one was going to be uh, the uh, strange or um, odd situations in the city. Another one, of course, was going to be my story in the city, not to write about myself, but to bear witness of the things I have seen uh, as, a, as uh, an inhabitant of this city. So that was the way to structure the city, take six different uh, imaginary subway lines and um, uh, cover them with issues that uh, had something to do among themselves. So when I had this idea, I said, well, I have like four or five characters, but I need like four or five uh, more and so on. So then I started to add uh, in a more systematical way, um, the, the remaining aspects of each of these uh, six uh, imaginary subway lines to, um, uh, to uh, know how this city works. I, I lived in a city, I lived in, in London um, for almost 18 years. Um, I didn't like it, I felt like an alien. I like the people there, the, the, I like the writers there and so forth. Um, I lived in New York when I was a, a student. And what I'm coming to first, when I lived in, in, any, in, in any city, New York or London, in any city, I didn't feel I lived in a city, I felt I lived in a house. And in London, I lived in a house, I wrote in my house and occasionally went, went outside. But basically if someone said, do you live in England? I'd say, no, I live in a house in London. But I had a certain, way of dealing with New York and a certain way of dealing with London. I had a personal map in my head and on my feet of London. There were places that I always went and places that I never went. There were parts of London, I still, they mentioned it to um, the Isle of Dogs, I never went there. Stepney, I think I drove through it once. North London, I didn't know very well. South London, I knew quite well. It, do you have a, a mental map, a personal map in your head of Mexico, Mexico City, where, where a place where you, you, you circulate among these restaurants, these cafes, this university, this house, these people. And, it, it, and that, so if I drew your map of Mexico City, would it have a certain shape and size? That's a very good question, Paul. Uh, of course, I have uh, places to which I, I go very often and they belong, let's say, uh, to my sentimental memory. So I have this kind of sentimental map of Mexico City, which is a reduction of the city because I, I, I tend to go to the same places. Um, my uh, city has uh, grown in such an amazing way that uh, in order to remain sane in this place, it's very important uh, to have uh, places that you know, places that uh, uh, remain the same because everything else is changing. So um, this city of my memory is told uh, in horizontal uh, vertigo, but that's just a small part of the city. It is very, very difficult to have an imaginary map of the whole city. Um, and I, uh, once I made an experiment with my little girl, she was like uh, six years old. Um, uh, we lived in Barcelona for three years. And I asked her to draw a map of Barcelona with the places uh, she knew best. And it was amazing because she uh, drew a map of Barcelona uh, with uh, the coast, the port, uh, the Citadel Park, and so on. And this map resembled exactly the Barcelona that my father had in his memory, because my father was born in Barcelona. He was born in 1922. And my uh, daughter, Ines, lived in Barcelona uh, in 2001. So it was like 80 years difference from my father's map and the map of my daughter. And the city, the core of the city, remained the same. And it was amazing because Barcelona has wonderful architecture, new architecture, but it remained a, 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 a traditional place. Uh, it you, has... you, men you, you mentioned this in the book. I mean, you, first you mentioned exactly. that, that, that story is in the book, but also you mentioned how Mexican cities, the core of Mexico, of Mexican cities is colonial 
and and that the, and unchanging, and that if you that if you if you go back to Oaxaca, you go back to Puebla, you go back to wherever, San Luis Potosi, Saltillo, you that's the Mexico of 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 history and memory, and then outside there's well what my when I was writing about mm -hmm. it, I I mean I, I, I when I was writing about Mexican City, I said I said by the way there's a Walmart that you know go past the pyramid and there's a Walmart. <laughs> go back, you know, go go past that um, that drugstore, and you'll find a Home Depot, or you know, whatever, uh, or, or a place making rubber tires and so forth. So, but the, the other thing I wanted to mention was that the, the book is it's horizontal, vertical. You know, I kept thinking of that that your book is horizontal, but it's like an inverted a place of inverted skyscrapers. It's like New York turned upside down and all the all the all the skyscrapers the aztec the mayan the, the you know uh the 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 ancient mexico was is is there as though the city was inverted do, do you mm -hmm. know what i mean that it's not that it's and it's not just a palimpsest some of them go deep down they go from you know not not, not just a layer but but penetrating deep um i also want to well, okay so you have the mental map of mexico city um, I well, ask... What I wanted to, to tell you, Paul, is that I had this mental map, but it's very difficult to have a, 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 a real map of the whole city. When I was talking about my, my, my daughter being able to uh, draw a city of Barcelona, then I asked her, can you write, can you draw a, a map of Mexico City? That was impossible for her, because as you say, there is this symbolic core of Mexico City, which is the a colonial city. But for my daughter, that's a far away place. She has no idea of the, what's going on there. So her city, it's a chaotic uh, uh, melange of streets and uh, uh, whatever you, uh, you can imagine, stores and so on. So it's very difficult to have a, an, a representation of this place. So um, I tried uh, with my book to have a narrative representation of a, a, a city that defies visual representation. Well, that's true because so much of it is in memory. I mean, one of the things, uh, uh, you went to a German school there. You're fluent in German. Sprecher yes. Deutsch. <laughs> yes, so, that, my, that's as good. I, yes, I learned to, <laughs> to write in, in, in German. That was my first written language. It's in incredible. Life. That's incredible. Yes. You, you worked in German. You were, were you in the diplomatic service in German? Yes, I was in the diplomatic service for three years and I used to work in East Berlin for three years from 81 to 84. But is it wasn't it amazing? You you, you meant, well, actually one of the things that um, one most the strangest most poignant thing is you're at your German school and you find your teacher weeping, and he's weeping, and you're saying what's good? Did I do something wrong? We weren't we're in Mexico, and he says today is Hitler's birthday, huh? Weird. Yeah, that, yes, that was strange because you know the the German school in Mexico was a stronghold for Nazi propaganda, and it was only natural because uh, uh, being the democratic government of uh, uh, Germany, the national socialist uh, government, uh, sent propaganda to um, Latin America, and uh, the German school was uh, instrumental uh, in distributing this kind of uh, propaganda. And many of my teachers they used to fight in the Second World War and uh, they uh, lost the war. And then they were teaching uh, Mexican children and some of them were quite nostalgic uh, of uh, the Third uh, Reich. So uh, it was quite strange to, to have this kind of education. You know, that's another aspect of Mexico City, that Mexico City, Mexico is a refuge. It's a refuge for people, Mormons in the North refuge for, for, for Trotsky. So Mexico City had Trotsky. You had um, uh, Bruno Traven. So Traven is in one here and Trotsky's over there. D.H. Lawrence was there. Malcolm Lowry was there. Um, the, it's, it, it, it's, it's a ref and for, for the Germans. That one of the things that impresses me about Mexico and Mexico City in particular is how hospitable Mexico is how hospitable and, and Mexico City people go there. Dorothea Carrington, one of the great painters and a brilliant writer, she was living in Roma district near where you and I were having a cup of coffee. She was living down the street. English woman, great writer. So it, it, 
that, that uh, uh, Mexico City absorbed these people. They're in your book. I mean, that, that, that's the other impressive thing about your book that you were able to include this. May I ask you another question about the mental map? Does your, obviously there are dangerous places in Mexico City. Many Americans think, I, I can't remember when this was, maybe 20 years ago, people say, you know, um, Mexico is really dangerous. Don't get in a taxi in Mexico City. You'll be killed. You'll be robbed. You know, uh, 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 places donde la vida no vale nada. Are those places, do you go to those places? Have you been to those places? Or is there a place in Mexico City where you wouldn't dare to go alone? Well, you have to take care and to be aware that there are some uh, dangerous places as uh, neighborhoods that are so far away, you don't know exactly what's going on and there might be some gangs and you know, uh, we, we have a lot of problems uh, with the drug trafficking all around Mexico as a country. So uh, Mexico City is not the exception. So there are places in which I don't feel uh, especially safe and uh, being the father of a 21 year old daughter, uh, sometimes I'm uh, really aware of these tough spots uh, in the city. And if uh, she's away because she went to a party, um, I mean, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, in a very uh, gentle mood and I'm waiting for her uh, quite uh, nervously. And uh, well, th that that's true. But you know, uh, there is a lot of myth also about the violence in Mexico City. And I, I like to remember a story by William Burroughs and uh, Jack Kerouac. Uh, Burroughs was uh, already living in Mexico City and Jack Kerouac uh, wrote to him and uh, asking uh, how violent was the city? Because he says, Bill, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to uh, cope with violence in Mexico City. And um, uh, William Burroughs gave him this memorable uh, answer. Don't worry, Jack, Mexicans, they only kill their friends. So it was <laughs> like the worst kind of hospitality that if you're, if, if you're friends with a Mexican, uh, he might kill you uh, out of but also, but, but there's another refuge, there's another refugee. I mean, that Burroughs was very happy in Mexico. He was living in Mexico. He could, he could get, and, and then um, Karak went there and they, and they both wrote about it. There's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier that, that, uh, People are, are happy that I, when I was in Mexico, I always felt welcomed. I always felt appreciated. I always felt respected, even though, you know, I'm an old gringo. I, I thought, I thought it's, it, 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 it's wonderful in, in that respect. But I was wondering, it, it's just, um, all cities have an area where, I mean, I, I'm on an island now. I'm in the island of Oahu. There are places on Oahu where I never go. I mean, I've been there maybe once, long time ago. They seem, along, it's an island, it's only, the farthest you can go here is 50 miles. But even so, I, uh, I, don't, I don't go there. And, and so I lived in Singapore, Singapore's an island, there are places I, I never went. So we all have our own uh, yes, way of, of dealing with it. Remember Paul, um, uh, Ambrose Beer's Devil's Dictionary, in which, uh, where he says, uh, Oh, he said, being a gringo in Mexico, that's euthanasia, no? That's right. Euthanasia, no? <laughs> uh, it, it was like uh, looking for um, a sure uh, assassination, no? And, and well, he, he and disappeared, he, he disappeared in, in Mexico <laughs> through to form. But you know, uh, what you were uh, saying is very important on a more serious note. Uh, I think that it's a city not only of hospitality, but also that welcomes in a, in a quite a profound way, way people from different cultures. And I, I had the experience, and I talk about it in, in the horizontal vertigo, about uh, contributing to the constitution of our city, because uh, we had a federal district and some a couple of years ago, uh, the city became the city became a federal state. So it needed a constitution, and there was this group of twenty eight uh, citizens that wrote the draft for this constitution, and I belonged to this uh, group. And the first choice we took was to um, have a definition of the inhabitant of the city. And we decided that anybody for the sole 
uh, situation of being there, of being in Mexico City, um, uh, had uh, this qualification as a sitting a citizen of uh, that place. So that's quite important because uh, the city gives you uh, uh, a sense of uh, uh, of belonging. Even if you are there for um, the first time, or you have been there for just a couple of hours, uh, you are part of the city and you have the rights of somebody who has lived for all his life in the city. And the, in the first page of the constitution, um, in, in the first phrase of the first page, it says, this city was founded uh, by people who came from far away. This is a city of welcoming, of welcoming to the people who want to be here. So it's, it's a quite interesting definition because uh, you take into account that the people, they, they, they belong to this place because they want to be here. That's the main reason to be part of the city. And I think that Mexican culture has to do with this welcoming of different tendencies and uh, different languages and cultures and so on. Yeah, I mean, th th that's definitely true. I remember when I was teaching there, um, there, were, th there were people from all over, people from Germany, there was a, a girl who was family was Jewish. There were uh, English people, there was you. I mean, your father was, is from Spain. And, and as you say in the book, from Spain, then he went to Belgium, then he came here. And then you have ancestors who've been there forever. So like your grandmother, who was, who was a writer, uh, your family history is, is fascinating. And so all those threads draw together. That's an American idea too. Or I mean, it, it's one that we aspire to that if no matter where you come from, you're, you're one of us and you have a right to be here. It's also why I didn't feel, I felt appreciated, I guess, in, in London, but I, I, I can't become an English person. I can't become uh, a Scottish person. I can, I can only be an alien there. I even carried an alien identity card, but so I was an alien, tolerated, and liked, I guess, but I never felt English. Whereas people go to Mexico, they do, they feel I'm part of the, I'm part of the process. That's why your book, by the way, is very humane because you write about everybody. You write about the, uh, the street sweeper, the sewer cleaner, the children, the millionaires. And uh, it's a very forgiving book. There's no, there's no rancor in your book. Although, and, 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 and you'd expect it in a book about Mexico, you think, about violence or dislike, you you talk about how difficult it is. I mean, you talk about in one place how um, De Gaulle said, "You, I can't govern. It's hard, or it's impossible to govern a, a nation with two hundred and forty-seven types of cheese." And then you say, "Well, we have chiles, but no one knows how many chiles there are." I mean, how can you govern a place where you say um, statistics are a form of conjecture? We don't know how many chiles. I like statistics as a form of conjecture. And by the way, your book is full of great one-liners like, what fails as ideology triumphs as nostalgia. I love that. But um, so the humanity in your book, the, the, the humane aspect, you're writing about, about real people, about the people who work in the city, people who live in the city, as well as, as the places where they live. So, I mean, that's, that's the un unusual thing. And the, the, the range of people that you write about is incredible. So, I mean, that's the, I know that you also, you write a column for the paper, you write novels, you write plays, you're writing a screenplay at the moment. I don't know where you found the time to do this or where you found even to make the effort of going out and meeting the, talking to the sewer cleaner, talking to the street sweeper, talking to the, you know, the zombie or, uh, you know, the, the tire repairman, every, every, everywhere you go, people are repairing tires. I used to see the sign, you know, Vulcanizado is the <laughs> Vulcan. Um, and you, you talk to the guy, I kept thinking, maybe I should get my tires fixed, but you actually meet these people. That's the greatness of the book. It's, it's got, the, it's the heart the, and the humanity of the book. Well, I, I like very much what you're saying. I, one of the main questions of living in the city is who, who owns the city? Who is the, 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 the real people? Or who are the real people responsible for the city? And uh, in Mexico, we have had uh, two major earthquakes 
in the last years, one in 1985 and the other one in 2017. And uh, both earthquakes gave us a, a very, very important lesson. And that is that uh, I think that you belong to a place in a real and profound sense when, when you feel responsible for, for the garbage, when, when, when you want to uh, uh, be responsible for uh, the, the fallouts, the detritus of the city. And that's what happened after the earthquake. We were there to recover uh, all the things that uh, uh, were destroyed in, in, in the city. And uh, many people came together at that time. And I saw the faces of the people after the earthquake. And some of them were faces I was seeing for the first time, but more importantly for many people, that was the first time they were uh, going to different places in the city because they were isolated in different communities, in different neighborhoods. And for the first time, they found this kind of responsibility for the city as a whole, as, as being part of this general collective. And I say, well, this is the real flame, uh, the real face of the city, but it's sometimes a hidden face. As you said earlier, the city has many layers. No, uh, we had a lake and the lake was obliterated because we built uh, streets and houses upon the lake and uh, there were pyramids and there were ceremonial sites and so on built by the Aztecs. It was a, a, a great city, Tenochtitlan, and uh, 500 years ago it was destroyed and it was buried. So underground there is the hidden lake and the hidden Aztec city and that's the city in the underground but it's like uh, if this city was sending messages to us and we can say the same about many inhabitants of the city people who we don't see or we take for granted, but you don't, we don't know their stories. So um, these two experiences of the earthquake, when I was taking part in uh, different uh, brigades, uh, trying to do something for, for the city, I said, well, I have to know better these people. I have to speak with them and I have to be in touch with people um, I don't, I don't um, get along or I, don't, I, don't, I have never uh, met before. And this kind of uh, hidden city made out of memories, made out of ancient history, but all, also, and most importantly, made out of unknown people, uh, was going to be uh, the city I wanted to write about. That's, that's amazing. You're talking about humility and cooperation and a community spirit. You end the book with this wonderful a uh, litany of, of people helping, the raised fist. That, that, I mean, I was going to read it, but the, who's ever watching this? No, you get no, the book. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to, want to, but you're also as, as attentive in the way that you are to, to humble people, to the humble places of Mexico City. For example, the uh, Zotejuela, the, the back patio, the back, what do you call it? The back patio or the back. So you could live in, I, I could have, been in Mexico long. I never noticed this. I never noticed how important the Zotejuela was, the back patio. And you talk about how this small area behind a house is the setting and the scene for so much drama, for a, a woman preparing food, for lovers conspiring, for people arguing, for people settling a score, for, pe for clothes drying, for people. It's just this small area of every house. It could be I mean, usually small, I guess, but it's so poignant in its, it, it, in its humble look. I mean, if you were photographing it, you would just see this little platform. It, that's all it is, is a platform, right? And you talk about the implications of it. I think that that's what impresses me about your book is that you're, you have the ability, which I think great writers have, or very good writers, as well as great writers. You notice things, you're a noticer. And whenever, I mean, I think that this distinguishes a good writer from a mediocre writer. The good writer notices things. They notice the expressions of things, but you know, you're also noticing, as I say, these humble people, but also the humble places. There's, there's a whole sequence of places in the book, but that, that's the most humble. It can't be, it can't be anything simpler than a, 
than a black a back patio of a house. I never know. But you say it's in films, it's in, in drama and, and so forth. So, I mean, this is a compliment, but it's also a way of saying, this is why I think your book is unusual. It's not, it's not an intellectual's book. Although you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Wittgenstein, Kant, you mentioned, uh, you know, all of, of the philosophy, your father was a philosopher. You mentioned your father's philosopher, uh, philosopher, philosophical books and so forth. But also you're, uh, at the very, at the most human level, which is, you know, the, the, of, 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 of people and where they live. This is the virtue of the book, the heart of the book, I think. Thank you. Well, talking about the Sotehuela, this kind of back patio, I think that this is one of the most mysterious places in, in the city because it belonged uh, to a kind of uh, hidden culture and it has to do with uh, the place that women have had in, 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 in Mexico City. We have a, a strong male chauvinistic culture and uh, in this place, this hidden place, this, this kind of uh, backyard, uh, women uh, came together. You know, it was the, the place for their secrets or uh, to sing songs or to share some cigarettes and so on. So when I was a child, I was always surprised that suddenly uh, women disappeared from houses or disappeared. Well, they were in this kind of uh, back patio, in this sotehuela, and they were uh, having a life of their own. Virginia Woolf uh, spoke about having a room of their own that was forbidden for many women in Mexico, but there was this kind of strange patio in which they, they, they could have this kind of uh, special uh, life. So um, I, I wanted to, to, to depict that, that kind of uh, scenes because they, they belong to, to, the, to the city, although um, most of the people, they don't take this into account. Well, I, well, apropos of that, somewhere else in the book, you say, what we see around us is deficient, but magnificent. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that, that's, uh, uh, that's in a way the this, this story of Mexico, but you also talk about the city built on top of ruins to produce more ruins. I, yeah, I, there's a special, I, there's a special grandeur of Mexico City that it's like a defeated city, but in a, in a magnificent way, you know. Uh, so, uh, and we um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we are really proud of this kind of ruins that we have. We are more proud of our uh, scars and our ruins that we are of a, of our new buildings. You know, I've written eleven travel books. And um, the 11th was On the Plain of Snakes, my book about Mexico. I have never felt more welcomed. I've never felt uh, more appreciated. I've never felt that I discovered more. Uh, I, I've rarely felt in traveling that I wanted to live in the place that I was traveling. In. I thought, I'm traveling. I'm making notes. I'll go home and write a book. I thought I could stay in Mexico forever. I think I, I found I, I could uh, retire to Mexico. I could go to Mexico. Well, we're waiting your return to Mexico, yeah. your Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, they're making a, the Mosquito Coast is being filmed in Mexico, uh, you know, and, and I wanted to visit, but the pandemic kept me away. But uh, anyway, that's the human element. But that's also the reason why your book is so important, because this will, this, this in-depth, the portrait, uh, this compl complex portrait of a place that has never been summed up like this. It's not the labyrinth of solitude. It's not where the air is playing, you know, to quote past, to quote Fuentes. You, you quote them, you're very generous with them, but I, mean, but, but I think it, it's way beyond that. It's way beyond that. And this is a book which Americans can read and, and understand and, and say, well, this is, we don't know this place. We went there, but we didn't realize how rich it was. Well, I know for a fact that there are a hundred museums in, in, in Mexico City and you, you, you talk about them. I mean, you talk about the architecture and so forth. But I think this is a, um, a great introduction uh, for, for, for Americans who are generally so ignorant. Um, or we know very little about the Mexican past. They, most Americans sitting in what used to be Mexico, they're in New Mexico, they're in Nevada, they're in California, they realize that was Mexico, it was stolen from, from, from Mexico and handed over Texas and all the rest of it. But an, Amer an American can, um, can understand it. But I, I think that Mexico stands out for me 
when I was traveling there as a place that I, I always wanted to go back to and, I, and, and see you and see our friends and, 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 and all of that. But as a place where I could, I could be like B. Trave and I could be like, I don't know, D.H. Lawrence. I could be a refugee there too. I could take, take refuge. Um, I, there's, there's so much more to say. I'm not gonna, the, the, the end of the book is, is, is uh, you say somewhere, uh, it was hard for me to finish this book. Why was it hard for you to finish the book? Well, you know, uh, Mexico City is uh, enormous, it's gigantic, so it's very, very difficult uh, to write about all the important aspects of the city. And, uh, well, I think the, the, the main danger of this kind of project is uh, to try to be a kind of encyclopedia of the city. Right. Uh, that's impossible. So yes. I, 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 I had to refrain from uh, this uh, thirst of totality. So yeah. I said, well, this is an approach to Mexico City. It's as comprehensive as I can do it, but uh, I want it also uh, to be uh, a book uh, you, can, you can read uh, in, in, a, in a quite pleasurable way. I uh, didn't want a book uh, that uh, was going to be a hard working reading book, no? Uh, uh, so that's why I had to refrain from writing about many other aspects of, of the city. And of course, when I meet people who have read the book, they tell me, well, uh, there was a chapter that you avoided about this or about that, of course. <laughs> there are many, many things that are lacking from this. of course yeah 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 yeah, yeah. but I, I i must say i enjoyed i i sat down with it but there, there's no effort at all I, and i was looking for i love the insights about you and i just i think it's a marvelous book you know it's uh, we only have about 10 minutes more ha, uh, hal is standing by maybe we should take some questions Perfect. Hal, what do you think i'm i'm on and we do have some great questions so let's okay. go ahead and dive into those um First question, did you read any of the other famous books about cities like the ones that Paul listed uh, to inform your approach that you took to writing Horizontal Vertigo? Well, yeah, uh, I've uh, read uh, Orhan Spamuk's book on Istanbul, which I like very most, much, and also V.S. Pritchett's book on, on London. Uh, oh, the novel that uh, book, uh, the, the Paul uh, quoted, uh, St. Petersburg by Andrei Bieli. I like it a lot, and well, Manhattan Transfer, the famous uh, John Dos Passos novel, and uh, many, many other ones. I, I'm, I'm a usual reader of books uh, about cities. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. How is writing about place different than, for you than writing about fiction, or were they very different at all? Well, it's a very interesting question because uh, when you write about uh, you write uh, about uh, an imaginary character or sometimes about an imaginary place, uh, you're free to improvise and uh, to reshape uh, the, the place of your imagination. Sometimes when uh, I, I write a novel set in Mexico City, I change some things of the city that are convenient to my story. Uh, or for example, there is one a short story I wrote about a, a, a young uh, um, a guy who aspires to be a soccer uh, player and he runs uh, across the city and this is an impossible run in the real, in the actual city because it's too long. It's more than a marathon. But I took uh, um, the freedom uh, to uh, reshape the city in order to have the story I wanted. But when you are writing about the actual city, uh, you have to be true to the mysteries of this place and uh, you have to uh, uncover some things that are hidden but that are real facts of the city. So if you are uh, quite attentive, uh, you are going uh, to realize that uh, the city is much more mysterious than you think. I always remember this legend that rearview mirrors have uh, underneath, that for me, it's like an oracle legend. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. So that happens when you're writing about uh, a city. You, you have to be aware that uh, the objects are closer than they appear. That's a tremendous answer. Um, a, a question for both of you, actually. When you start to write about a place, how do you choose where to start? Well, P Paul, please. 
you have to be in the place. I think you have to live in the place. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm sort of against visiting. Whenever I go to a place, I, um, I never think about leaving. I think about um, walking in the city, talking to people, uh, trying to acquaint, acquaint myself with it. And I think you can't write anything if you don't have a thought in your head. I tend to think when people say, um, I'm trying to write a book, but I, I'm stuck. I don't, I don't know, uh, I, can't, I can't write. I've writer's block. I, have to, I think that a lot of writer's block is, is not having anything to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not about not being able to, it's, it's really not having a thought. So it's, it's making uh, connections. I didn't write about Mexico City. I, when I went, to, I found Mexico City so daunting as a place. It's a city, you, you talk about the, the statistics. How many people are in Mexico City? 20 million, 25 million, no one knows. You, I mean, I think you say in the book, no one knows. It's another case of <laughs> statistics are just a matter of conjecture. <laughs> so when I was in Mexico City, I had a map. I, there were places that I went. I went to the Barrows house where Carrack was, Dorothea Carrington. I went to the class at Horizontal where I was teaching. I went to the museums. So I had my own place, but I, I wanted to go further afield. But I found, and I saw this is why I'm impressed with the book. Um, above all. I found a city that I would have found impossible to write about. I could write about Oaxaca. I did write about and Puebla and Saltillo and Reynosa because I was there. They're small there. I can contain them. I can, I can actually find my way around them. But I found, so the way, the short answer is you have to live in a place. You have to breathe its air. You have to smell it. You have to listen to it. And you have to, a, a, a place is nothing without its people. So you need the human element is, is, is very strong. That's how I would go about it. I would go about it in a similar way to, to Juan. This book would have been impossible for Juan to write if he wasn't a novelist. It's written by a novelist. And when you're reading it, you know that a novelist is writing it because he knows how to write about landscape. He knows to write about people and he knows how to, how to tell a story. But there's, I just want to say, one of the things that I'm going to think about forever in your book is when you're interrogated by a bureaucrat and the bureaucrat says to you, when someone says to me, yes, three times, I know I don't trust him. I know he's lying. I know, no, I know he's not listening. When someone says yes, three times, I know he's not listening. Great. So uh, to write about a city, you write about the people, the, uh, the, the beating heart of the, of the city. I don't know, Juan, how, how would you go about it? Yes, well, uh, Paul has written 11 travel books and he's much more versatile than I am. So to write a travel book or to write about the place, I need a, a very strong sentimental uh, connection. I wrote a travel book on Yucatan. My mother was born in Yucatan, as well as my grandmother. So uh, it was not that easy for me to write about this place. Uh, but then I realized that I was really writing about my grandmother and my mother. And that sentimental connection made it possible for me to have a special link uh, to Yucatan. And the same happened with horizontal vertical because I love uh, my city so much and I hate my city so much mm -hmm. that I think, well, this is a, a great, great uh, writing material. I would like to say one more thing more. The most difficult subject is where you live. The most difficult subject is your city, your town, your family, your house, where you live. It, to write about something else, you're projecting onto it and you're, and you're, and you're simplifying it. But that's the other thing that, that impresses me. You're from Mexico City. You're a Chilango. So you, you, you know the place, but how, you, you need a method to write about it. It's really, really hard. Yes, any, writer, was, any writer will tell you that. It, it's practically impossible to write about where you come from. That's, that's true. The, there was a, a great uh, writer and journalist in Mexico called uh, Vicente Leñero, and he had a workshop. And the first assignment in his workshop was to write about this, uh, the street where you live. And uh, he said, that's the most difficult uh, thing to write about because you take everything for granted. And how can you write with surprise about something that is very well known to you? So uh, how can you discover the surprise of the usual things? And well, that's a learning that's very, very important for, for a writer. And of course, 
And I think that's really difficult. And well, I, I try to, to, to try my hand in, in this aspect in horizontal vertical. That was just a try. I mean, you did you did quite well. Um, we'll take. We have room for one more question, uh, and and this is from um, a fellow who says, "I have lived in um, Mexico City for the last two years, and I am fascinated by it. I loved your book. It captures the city perfectly. To me, Mexico City feels a bit like New York City or London or Paris did before gentrification. Full of art, culture, life in all shape and form. Do you think, like New York or London or Paris, that this might change?" Oh, well, an interesting question. Some two or three days ago, I was talking about this subject with m many friends because, of course, uh, gentrification is uh, uh, going on all around uh, the world. And, well, I, I hope Mexico remains a humane place and it's not going to be uh, a, a place for extremely rich people. And I, I, I live for some months in San Francisco and there is a an affordability crisis in San Francisco because rents are, are skyrocketing and so on. And uh, well, we have to fight in Mexico uh, so that uh, our city remains a humane city uh, and that uh, uh, the, the actual citizens remain in that place. Because one of the most uh, sad things about many places is that uh, the usual habitants are expelled from the city. That happened in many places. I was living for three years in Barcelona, as I said, and in Barcelona, in the posh neighborhoods, families that were uh, had lived there for uh, centuries, they had to move to other places and then uh, came Japanese or Canadian entrepreneurs um, to live in, in those places. So I think we, we, we have to, to, to be an actual community to defend the city. So that's one of the tasks of the city to uh, understand that not only after the earthquakes, we have and uh, we belong to the same community. We have to defend the place on a daily basis. That's as good a spot to end things as anything. As uh, uh, soon as I get my second vaccination, Paul and I are gonna come visit and uh, you'll take us around um, <laughs> and we'll have a great time. So uh, Juan, Paul, thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been absolutely lovely. And, and uh, Juan, we can't wait to, to get this book further out into the world than it already is. It is brilliant, as, as Paul has said. Um, and uh, for everyone who's watching um, in the chat, I have links to purchase the book, um, as well as a pre-order link to Paul's upcoming book. So please, most importantly, click and buy um, these brilliant books. And otherwise, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and we will see all of you soon. Stay safe, stay well. Thank okay. you. Good night. <laughs>